All right. No, there we go. Welcome tonight to Jeff and June. We have another great evening of entertainment for you, and I'm so glad you could be here. Our first presenter tonight is Maria Grace, who I'm sure you all know quite well um, from her great books, and she has a new one on pre-order now, Kellynch Dragon Persuasion. Please tell me I got the title right. <laughs> <laughs> so the fifth of her drag, no, you've got six in the dragon yeah, suit, it's, it's right? Six. I wasn't gonna argue, but yeah, there's several of them out. Yes. And she'll be starting us out tonight. So I'm so glad you could all join us. Uh, and all yours, Marie Grace. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot to say the most important thing. Our book sale is going on this weekend. Yes. So please stop by Austin Variations and find out what great ebooks you can get for 99 cents or $1.99. And now Jack won't kill me. Um, so <laughs> go ahead, Grace. <laughs> Okay, thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, tonight we're starting out, I, I kind of threw out several topics on uh, the Facebook group and uh, asked what people would be most interested in. And the one that won out was uh, The Itch for Acting, Jane Austen and the Scandalous Home Theatrical. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, most of us kind of recognize the home theatrical from uh, Jane Austen's probably probably least popular book, which is Mansfield Park. That one, it, it's really hard to get a whole lot of, oh boy, I get to read Mansfield Park because Fanny Price is, is maybe not the most exciting here when she's certainly not Elizabeth. Uh, but we see the home theatrical that uh, the group is performing, they're performing Lover's Vows and a lot of the plot revolves around that theatrical and what it reveals about the characters. And as we look at the um, whole, it was kind of a cultural thing, a cultural pastime of the home theatrical. There's a lot of different its and bits to kind of suss out of what uh, Austin was writing about. And that's what I'd like to share with you tonight. I'm gonna put up a screen share here. There we go. And hopefully this will switch over nicely. Yes, it looks like we got that screen going. So if I, I'm looking back and forth, please forgive me. I've got two screens and multiple windows open. So I'm just trying to keep track of what I'm looking at and what I'm doing here. Um, there we go. Uh, England has a very long theater tradition and this includes both public and private professional and, and amateur efforts. We can trace uh, some of the history all the, all the way back to the 10th century where dramas started appearing in church services. So that was really where all of it began. Uh, by the 12th century, the uh, British crusaders brought back traditions from other cultures, which took the religious dramas from the church services and had them performed outside the church. So we're moving from simply religious dramas in the church services to religious dramas outside the church building. And as soon as you stepped outside the church building, uh, other groups started getting really interested and we see secular groups and eventually guilds taking over. And there is a plethora of different kinds of theater being done by this point in time. Uh, by the end of the medieval period, which is, mm, depending on who you ask, you know, up into the 13, 1400s, uh, secular dramas became more prevalent than the religious ones. So we've moved from very much the church-based um, traditional dramas to secular dramas where schools and universities are starting to add uh, studies of the plays themselves to the curriculum. Uh, in the Renaissance, we see large public theaters being established and Shakespeare's Globe was one of those. Uh, 
slightly later in uh, 1596, the uh, new Blackfriars Theater became a private indoor theater. So we're moving from very large outdoor theaters to now indoor theaters, which give the advantage of being able to perform in the winter. So now we have year round theater being available uh, in a secular setting rather than the church setting. Uh, all of this kind of came to a screeching halt temporarily uh, during the um, Puritan Revolution in the mid 1600s. And then there was a, a brief decline in theater uh, while that was going on. But by the 1660s, during the restoration, theater picked up again. And we see the Drury Lane and Covenant Garden theaters uh, were officially licensed at this time. So those are the big major theaters in London. So really by the 1660s, we see a very active um, theater culture starting to develop. By the early 18th century into the, into the early 1700s, Theater expanded from just spoken dramas to include ballad, opera, farce, pantomime, uh, and a whole host of other things like uh, ballet, musical performances, acrobatic displays like we think Cirque du Soleil and some circus performances. So we now see this widening tradition by the 1700s and into the beginning of the Georgian era where now we start to see celebrity performers. Uh, and that's kind of the, the very, very quick history of where theater started from and, and how we get to where we were in the Georgian era, where we start to see home theater becoming kind of a big deal. Now, one of the first recorded home theatricals was actually in the 1600s, not in the 1700s into the Georgian era. Uh, and this was kind of the precursor, you know, something always kicks off a movement. And we see uh, several aristocrats uh, starting to have theater in their own homes. The first recorded home theater was in 1623 in Sir, Sir Edward Daring's home in Kent. Um, where uh, an original adaptation of Shakespeare's Henry IV was performed. In 1634, the, per the premier performance of Milton's, Milton's Comus was staged at Ludlow Castle in Wales for the er first Earl of Bridgewater. And what's very interesting about that one is his children performed in that theater. So now we're seeing common people becoming involved in these performances. And through those, we start to see what uh, in the literature is often referred to as the itch for acting developing, uh, really as a craze that picked up momentum, hitting its peak between 1770 and 1810, where there were amateur and professional theatricals going on all over the place. Uh, aristocrats held a lot of their performances, certainly on their estates. Sometimes they built their own theaters on their estates. Uh, the Earl of Barrymore spent six, uh, 60,000 pounds in the late 1770s, and that is an enormous sum uh, for the era. I mean, it's a lot of money now, but it's an enormous sum for the era. He, he built his own private theater uh, based on the King's Theater in the Haymarket that supposedly seated 700 on his estate. So he was obviously a real theater buff and uh, looked to host a large number of uh, performances privately within his domain. Uh, Richmond House, the home of the Duke of Richmond, also performed a lot of very expensive uh, performances. Uh, the amount spent on a home theatrical could range from nothing done, you know, just as a, you know, thing done to keep occupied at home to tens of thousands of pounds if sets were being built, uh, performers were being hired, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second, uh, costumes, 
advertising, playbills, all of that could rack up the money really fast. So it was an opportunity to show the ability to spend a lot of money. Uh, even though it was considered an amateur performance, uh, a lot of the aristocracy would hire professional actors to bolster the amateur performances. And actresses were often hired to help preserve the reputation of young ladies so they wouldn't be performing uh, on stage. And we'll talk more about that in a little while as well. Uh, theater crowds could range from how many people you could fit in your dining room uh, to audiences into the hundreds. As, as I said before, in one of the specially built theaters at that set 700, um, some of the great houses could accommodate 150 in uh, the interior rooms. And I'm, uh, my mind just boggles at the thought of inviting 150 people over to my house to do anything. You know, 15 is an enormous crowd. So these were really, really um, big deals when, when that happened at the great houses. Uh, theatrical endeavors didn't necessarily have to be performed at a great house though. Uh, townhouses, country estates, assembly rooms, uh, public assembly rooms, most uh, small villages had an assembly room of some sort and amateur theatricals could be performed in those assembly rooms. Uh, military encampments would host performances, even um, naval vessels would host performances. At home, kitchens, barns, greenhouses, wherever you could fit people and fit a stage, uh, you could host a theatrical. So there was this wide variation between, you know, little homegrown affairs performed in the living room to these huge things that were almost indistinguishable from professional theater. What we see in Austin's Mansfield Park is something that leans more towards the extravagant, but certainly not on the level of uh, some of the ones that were seen in the era. Now, what distinguished an amateur theatrical versus a professional one? Interestingly, it was not the presence of the professional actors. It was about the licensing of the theater. In 1737, unpaid public performances were made illegal due to the Licensing Act of 1737. This was in Walpole's government and it increased government's control over public theater a lot, not just a little bit, but a lot. And it happened in two different ways. In the first, the um, Licensing Act said spoken dramas, and this is important, spoken dramas, could only be performed legally at the Two the at the theaters holding royal patents, and that was the Royal Theater in um, Covenant Garden and the Drury Lane Theater. So those two royal theaters could perform spoken dramas. Now, things like opera, which were sung, that was different. Uh, comedies, that was different. But a spoken drama was limited to those two theaters. On top of that, all new plays, additions to old plays, prologues and epilogues performed in those theaters, and I'm gonna talk about the prologues and epilogues in just a second, had to be submitted to the Lord Chamberlain two weeks before the performance for approval. So not only were dramas, professional dramas limited to those patent theaters, what they could perform was also controlled by the Lord Chamberlain. And he had the power to refuse any performance of any play. His decision was final and there was no appeal. So there was a lot of government control over the theater. And in some ways that kind of made the opportunity for amateur theater uh, very inviting because it allowed for a lot of uh, performance that wouldn't otherwise be allowed. It also, and I'm trying to figure out how to say this well, the amateur theatrical could get away with a lot of philosophic and political commentary that might and probably wasn't allowed at the, the main theaters. So this 
uh, was a very different kind of entertainment. The thing that set the amateur theaters apart is they couldn't charge for tickets. So uh, they could pay actors and actresses to perform, they just couldn't charge for tickets. Now, some of them would take up um, donations to be usually uh, to be donated to charity, but uh, in the case of, of the aristocracy, it, it wasn't about recouping the money that you spent. Yeah, there we go. A little bit about the um, night at the theater. It was a little different from what we experience today and from what we think about. Uh, you didn't just go to the theater to see a play and that was it. The, the play that you would see would be considered the main piece. That was the main attraction, the main event. However, there was often a lot of other things going on around it. So you would have the main piece, then you'd often have something afterwards as an afterpiece. You could have uh, entree act entertainments, which would happen in between the acts. So you might have uh, a musical performance or an acrobat or um, a farce, a comedy, a pantomime happening in between the acts of the play or afterwards. Then there were the prologues and the epilogues, which were uh, written independent of the play itself and meant to be transitions from the real world into the world of the drama. And they were delivered before and after the play. Uh, and we'll talk more about those in a little bit. Uh, so the home theatricals might emulate that as well. So in addition to the play itself, oftentimes the amateur players would write uh, prologues and epilogues, which were an opportunity to express uh, philosophical um, opinions, political opinions, uh, critical opinions about the play and uh, moralizing about it or not. Uh, so those actually, often got a lot of attention. Uh, many times for amateur theatricals, those were published in full in the local papers. Uh, the performances for amateur theatricals were also often publicized in the local papers. And you know, knowing what the gossip columns were like in the day, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to start to think about the things that could and might be said um, about the players in a theatrical, about uh, criticizing or praising the theater itself, how it was conducted, the sets, the costumes, the whole thing, as being a commentary on those who were holding it. And if there were uh, women involved and acting how their reputations could easily be impacted by that kind of very public commentary. So when we start to look at how uh, amateur theatrical could impact uh, a young lady's reputation, we, we can, as we understand how public these things were, they weren't necessarily very private. They could be very public affairs it starts to be a little easier to see how they could become uh, rather problematic. And uh, if you have any questions while, while we're chatting here, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll try to uh, get to those. Actually, I can't, with the screen sharing on, I can't see the uh, chat window right now, but uh, I will try to, to talk on those points as we get a little further on. Uh, one of the reasons why amateur theatrical be, theatricals really moved from being just a convenient way to get more theater out there to a, a genuine cultural craze is all about the distinction of preserving rank. Um, you know, one thing that we know, particularly in this era, that we had a very, very class-driven society. 
And the upper classes wanted to be seen as um, Sir Walter in Persuasion was apt to say, the baronet to be living as a baronet. The upper classes wanted to be seen as living in a fashion appropriate to their class. And theater was one of those ways to be to see and to be seen. Uh, there were a number of things culturally going on at this point that started to make public theater somewhat less appealing uh, to the upper classes. As we see the rise of the merchant class in this era, people had disposable income and more people could afford to go to the theater. Now, there was a division in the theater between the expensive seats and the cheap seats, just, just like we see today. Uh, but because we had more cheap seats, we also saw a change in the, the nature of the theater experience to some degree. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Oh, hang on just a second. OK. Uh, the expensive seats were in boxes and the most expensive seats for the aristocrats, they actually sat on the stage itself with the performers. So the, um, the most expensive seats for the aristocrats were in front of the audience. They got to be seen with the actors. They were on display almost as much as the players were. In front of the stage was the pit or the gallery where the cheap seats were. And sometimes they, they weren't even sitting, they were standing. What happened there though was uh, the audiences would often talk among themselves. They literally would throw rotten fruit and vegetables at the actors if they didn't like what was going on, if they were dissatisfied with the performances. Uh, they would scream and yell and boo. Uh, one diarist reports mooing like a cow at a performance he didn't like. Um, and this is without you know, modern sound equipment, so they could completely disrupt a play. Um, large quantities of alcohol and food were consumed. People would bring it with them into uh, the theater. And so you got a really rowdy crowd. So rioting at theaters was not uncommon. Uh, Drury Lane was destroyed six different times in that century due to rioting. So it was not a small problem. Uh, and the aristocracy didn't really like being in the middle of all of that. Uh, so we saw a move that started to have the upper better classes separating themselves from the public theater. And one of the ways they did that is by moving into private arenas where the um, behavior of the patrons could be controlled, but also because it allowed the aristocracy to make the theater then an element of being seen and seeing and sociability became part of what was being exchanged there. So it was a way to show off, to show your wealth to everybody else, and to exchange social favors. Uh, Mariah? Yes. Before we leave the public theater realm, I've got a couple questions for you off of YouTube. I sure hope I have answers. <laughs> Rita wants to know how long were the plays back then? And with all those momentums you've mentioned, how much time would people remain in the theater? They could go on a long time, um, hours and hours and hours, because you could have a play which could take a couple of hours and then the epilogue and the prologue and depending on how many acts you had you could have things going on in between each act so we could talk about five or six hours this wow. was not a a quick in and out sort of entertainment and uh kim bell wants to know were the aristocrats ever impromptu on the spot brought into the play if they were sitting on the stage with the actors <laughs> that is an excellent question and i haven't read 
any accounts of it happening, but that's not to say that it didn't. I just haven't encountered uh, any um, reports of it having happened. So um, I have just because I haven't read it doesn't mean it didn't happen. I'm just not familiar with it. Okay, that's all I got for now. Um, the aristocrats sitting in the front box certainly might have in been introduced or welcomed into the theater, particularly if you know they patronized uh, the theater and lent an air of um, respectability and nobility to the theater. They certainly might have been introduced. Uh, so the private theater helped preserve the distinction of rank by creating a limited audience uh, of invitees in an environment that the aristocracy could control very tightly. We moved from this very rowdy plebeian environment to something that could be much more refined. And that was one of the major driving forces for the home theatrical. And eventually it, it also helped to bring its downfall, which we'll, we will come back to. Um, uh, Grace. Yes. Quit, uh, before you move on, Jenna had a question for you about the painting on your last slide. Uh, let me get back to it. Yes. That was a painting of a crowd gathering for the theater. Uh, waiting to to be let in and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned I actually meant to talk about that and I missed that point in my notes um, that that was a crowd waiting to get into the theater and you can see uh, the upper class uh, family on the left hand side surrounded by uh, lower classes pushing and getting rowdy and this and you can see the the folks on the roof and heaven only knows what mischief they were up to uh, and it's just an illustration of how the theater was starting to become um, much less refined and appealing to the, the uh, upper classes. Do you happen to have the artist who wrote, did this one? Um, I would have to look it up. I don't have it right off the top of my head, but um, I definitely would be able to find it. I'm just thinking if you could you know, write me a note somewhere and remind me I can get that information. Awesome. Thank you. So in the late 1700s, 1782 to 1789, we know that Austin and her family were performing plays in the Steventon rec Rectory where they were living. And they were usually using the family dining parlor to do it. So this tells us a few things. One, in the family dining parlor, we're probably not hosting crowds of 100. So this is gonna be a small, intimate gathering uh, and probably very much limited to family and maybe some close friends in the neighborhood. Um, you know, given the kind of space we're talking about, you know, maybe an audience of 10, 12, that would probably be about the size limit that, that we would expect. Uh, so there, these were small, modest scale home theatricals. And under those parameters of being small and um, modest, they were considered to be acceptable activities for young people, even a good way to uh, spend their time in a productive fashion. Uh, many times when young men and women went off to boarding school, they were actually trained in acting because it was thought to be a good tool in teaching elocution and the grace of movement. In the era, especially for young women, the ability to move gracefully and have excellent posture was considered a hallmark of beauty. And so it was extremely desirable for young women to be able to move very gracefully, to stand up very straight, and to be able to speak well for both genders was considered important. So many times uh, young people did have training in acting, even though there was absolutely no thought that any one of these classes would 
become professional actors or actresses. It was considered part of the school curriculum. And actually uh, performing plays became part of the public school curriculum in England in the 16th century. So it had been around a long time in schools and considered an important part of education. Uh, this um, costume, scenery, all those kinds of things for the plays also afforded opportunities for creative expression. Uh, the scenery for theatricals was often done by the family themselves. And so uh, particularly young women who had been trained in painting and drawing would use it as an opportunity to show off those skills as well. Although if there were no artists in the family and the family could afford it, sometimes they did hire artists to create the backdrops uh, for the scenery. Costumes and props are the same way. You might repurpose what you already had at home or if you've got more money to spend. And we see this in Mansfield Park where there's a, a fair amount of money spent on volumes of fabric for curtains for the theater, which then sneak off to Ann Norris's house uh, after uh, the whole thing is shut down. One thing to remember that, that Austin is also communicating through this is that fabrics, textiles in the era were very, very expensive, much more expensive than the labor to do the sewing. And so in Mansfield Park, with all this money being spent on fabric, it's a, a statement about how much money was being spent and spent in a very frivolous way uh, by the Bertrams to do this theatrical when uh, Sir Thomas isn't home to oversee the expenditures. So that, that's kind of a subtle thing that uh, Austin slips in through the uh, use of the home theatrical. What we also can see from the Austin family doing plays is that Austin was very familiar with what it took to perform a play and uh, what might be going on in the midst of trying to, to get a play to happen. Uh, one of those issues was the morality of the plays. And here is where we see Austin really picking up on the use of the theatrical to um, illustrate some moral issues. In the culture as a whole, attitudes towards the home theatrical began to shift in the 1790s. So about halfway through the craze, which as I said before, it hit the peak between 1770 and 1810, right at the halfway mark in the 1790s, uh, attitudes began to shift. And they began to shift for a number of different reasons. One of those was the extravagance and expense that the aristocracy would lavish on these performances was starting to be seen as um, vulgar and debauchery and immoral. Uh, and there were a lot of concerns about what was really going on. And certainly the uh, extravagant expenditure of wealth was starting to be looked down upon, especially as uh, debts started mounting for the aristocracy. Uh, we see caricatures of the theater. The one on the slide right now is, uh, I believe that's a Gilray caricature of the theater. And if, I, I love these caricatures because you can look you can take a magnifying glass and start studying all the elements that are involved, which really reveal uh, attitudes of the day. But you know, clearly, what we see is a group preparing for the theater, and you know, a, a lot of impropriety. You see a, an actress dressing in the presence of men just to start with, and we could go on from there. Uh, but there is a lot of concern for the um, extravagance, the environment that uh, home theatricals are starting to take. Uh, in the early 1800s, around 1802, we saw something called the Picnic Society. And this was a theater club. It was a dinner theater club. And 
a picnic in the day was more of a potluck dinner, what we would call it today. So people would each contribute dishes to bring to the dinner. And it started out kind of a dinner club organized by the Countess of Buckinghamshire. She, however, really, really liked to gamble. And so in the midst of the theater uh, presentations, we also had a lot of card playing and gambling going on. And eventually there were so many accusations of decadence and debauchery surrounding the picnic society that it was forced to fold. And that is really um, a good example of the increasing concerns for what was going on behind all of these theatricals uh, that, that eventually led to the uh, demise of the home theater experience. One of the more subtle things that we would not pick up on today were the uh, prologues and the epilogues that I mentioned before. Uh, in the home theaters that were done, uh, we know that um, Austin's brothers, James and Henry, were very active, very active instigators in the theatricals. And they both wrote prologues and epilogues for the plays, which would have been read. Now, in these um, pieces, like I said before, they were designed to help the audience shift from the real world to the world of the theater and then back out. On the public stage, one of the lead actresses was usually the one who spoke the epilogue after the play was over. And this doesn't really seem like a problem to us today. Okay, next. However, because actresses were not gentlewomen, they were generally stereotyped as having loose morals and were definitely not who you wanted your daughters to associate with, much less to become. There was an air of sexual innuendo that permeated the epilogues of these plays. So audiences kind of expected that anything said in these, particularly by the actresses, had a lot of sexual innuendo attached to it, whether or not it was written there or not. And you know, when people are expecting it, people are probably writing it in as well. And so simply by having these epilogues and the prologues, it, it already caused people to question uh, the morality of what was going on and who was involved. Now, uh, one way amateur theater tried to distance itself from this was to have both men and women speak the epilogue to try to give it a little bit of distance from all the connotation attached to the actresses. Uh, but it didn't really change the fact that we saw theaters starting to get into more and more shaky ground. Um, we see in that same era, just about the time that theaters, home theater is starting to decline, uh, there were, in 1814, uh, Austin, Maria Edgeworth, and Frances Burney all used uh, home theatricals as literary devices to expose some of the less savory aspects of their characters and their worlds. And it's, it's kind of interesting that all three women authors would use this device uh, as a means of exposing moral issues within uh, their novels. And all of them had participated in home theatricals themselves. So this kind of suggests that they were writing from the inside having seen or thought they had seen some of these things happen. Uh, Mansfield Park, Austin's work, we have Fanny who, whose virtue is revealed because she, she's in opposition to the entire affair. Uh, and Mariah Bertram and Henry Crawford, of course, end up in their downfall as a result of what goes on with the, the with the theatrical. In um, Mariah, Mariah Edgeworth's work, Patronage, 
she focuses on what a talent for acting might indicate about sincerity and integrity, especially for the female actress. And this is a theme that we see in the concern about home theatricals, is if someone can truly act a part well, are they really acting or is this revealing part of themselves? Uh, and what's their integrity like if they can fake this, if, if that makes sense there? So uh, Edgeworth uses it to reveal the true character of uh, one of her characters, uh, Georgiana, who is proven to be very insincere by the whole thing. And then Frances Burney in The Wanderer uses private theatricals to uh, question and disrupt hierarchies of class and gender. Her um, characters kind of move around in different classes and uh, portraying different ge in gender roles, which is another issue that we see uh, being of concern in the uh, home theatricals. Here you have to really have a picture of what Georgian society looked like. It had a couple of very significant characters and they really came out of the excesses that led to the French Revolution and were kind of a reaction to it. We saw uh, the excess and the very um, lifestyle of the court leading to the French Revolution. And then there was a pushback in English society that came out of that, which meant that uh, what was really appreciated in society and really thought proper was restraint and polite behavior. Uh, proper and polite behavior became almost akin to a religious value and in, in many cases substituted for a religious morality in the era. So it wasn't just a matter of being nice or behaving nicely and following all the rules. Uh, polite behavior and appropriate behavior was crucial to maintaining a good reputation. Uh, and everyday life in the 18th century. Uh, one researcher defined and identified 250 categories of everyday life in the 18th century, including things like gender, class, social status, rank, race, national allegiance, and we could go on for the rest of the 250. And all of those categories had very specific boxes, definitions, and you needed to fit in that box. When you started blurring the lines, chaos could ensue. And remember, we are coming out of the chaos of the French Revolution. And so avoiding that chaos and staying within your sphere was important. Um, in Pride and Prejudice, we see Lady Catherine admonishing Elizabeth about leaving the sphere to which she was born. And we, we kind of think of it as Lady Catherine's just kind of going over the top, but that was actually a very significant sentiment of the era that uh, people needed to stay within the sphere to which they were born. And breaking out of those boundaries was considered to be dangerous and uh, potentially divisive. So acting, had people blurring those lines, playing parts that might not match up with who and what they were. And so seeing those lines blurred came to be considered as morally dangerous, particularly for children and young women who needed to be protected from the potentially ruinous effects of seeing those lines blurred and maybe starting to consider blurring them themselves. And this is part of uh, what we're seeing in Mansfield Park is, is those blurring of character with uh, particularly with Mariah Bertram and Henry Crawford as they are 
uh, playing their characters, we also see that they're starting to blur their own interests with those of the characters. Um, another place where we saw restraint cast off was emotional restraint. As I mentioned before, uh, proper in keeping yourself under good regulation and particularly emotional regulation was extremely important in polite society. Women could swoon if they saw something horrific enough, they, they were allowed to swoon, but that's about it. And men were not encouraged to display a great deal of emotion. Naturally, the um, trend in theater, the mode of acting that was popular at the time is what would strike us today as being very melodramatic. Actresses swooned excessively in displays of emotion on the stage and male actors ranted and railed expressively. So it was an extreme. On stage, they did all these things that proper men and women didn't do, even if their characters were proper men and women. The way they expressed themselves was not by any means proper. And so simply to engage in acting the way it was popular to do, it was expected to do in the time, led people to what was considered then to be improper behavior. We would just look at it and say, okay, they're way overacting. But then those displays were uh, really morally shaky. They, they caused question of the character. Who, who is this person who can do these things? On top of all of that, home theatricals, well, any kind of theatrical uh, expression could involve physical contacts between actors and actresses, which is one of the reasons why actresses had terrible reputations. They were not gentlewomen by any stretch of the imagination. And you definitely never wanted to see your daughter perform in professional theater if you were in the gently born classes. Uh, in plays at home in amateur theatricals, there was this opportunity for stage business between uh, actors and actresses which blurred, again, blurred the lines of propriety, could ask questions about what's the nature of their character and the sincerity and integrity of the person involved and was considered improper behavior. So, you know, that, that was just one more layer that led to a lot of concern for the propriety of individuals involved. Um, a moralist in the era, Reverend Thomas Gisborne in 1797 summed up the situation, and I'm gonna read the quote to you here. He says, for some years past the custom of acting in plays in private theaters and homes, fitted up by individuals of fortune, <clears throat> and this has prevailed. Take the benefit of all these favorable circumstances, yet what is even the tendency of such amusement? To encourage vanity? to incite the thirst of applause and admiration of attainments which, if they are to be thus exhibited, would be commonly have better been for the individuals not to possess, to destroy diffidence by the unrestrained familiarity with the persons of other, the other sex, which invariably results from being joined with them in the drama, to create a general fondness for the perusal of play, plays, which, of which so many are unfit to be read, and for attending dramatic representations of which so many are unfit to be witnessed. So basically what he is saying is that we see people being um, vain and encouraged in their vanity and to enjoy attention and applause, uh, to engage in unrestrained familiarity with those of the opposite sex, to create a fondness for uh, seeing plays, many of which are morally questionable, and for participating in them. So all in all, Gisborne kind of sums this up as uh, not really a very good thing. One thing we do know is that Cassandra Austin 
read Gisborne's work and gave it to her sister Jane in 1805. And Austin wasn't too sure what she was going to think of it, but she did read it and found herself approving of it. So this gives us some indication that Austin had some concerns about the appropriateness of what was going on in home theatricals. And it's particularly interesting when you look at what, uh, what some of the things going on in her own home were. Uh, in 1887, Eliza Hancock, one of Austin's cousins, performed a home theatrical called The Wonder with the Austins in their Steventon home. Eliza played the heroine while Austin's, Jane Austen's brother Henry played the hero. Austin family tradition said Eliza flirted with both brothers James and Henry, and that the play offered many opportunities for stage business, as it was called, between the hero and the heroine. Ten years later, Eliza and Henry were married after Eliza's first husband was guillotined in France in uh, 1794. Uh, all of which kind of leads one to wonder what Austin must have thought of all of this. Uh, it's not a huge leap that some have suggested that Austin was inspired by what she saw there to write uh, Mary Crawford in Mansfield Park, as well as what was going on with uh, Henry and Mariah Bertram. Uh, also, Lady Susan was thought to have been inspired by some of this and several pieces of her juvenilia. So it really seems like Austin herself had some concerns with what could be going on in home theatricals and uh, some of the things she saw in her own family, which I, I think is always kind of uh, interesting. So we've got about three or four minutes left. Do we have uh, any questions or thoughts or comments uh, that you would like to uh, throw out before we're done? Do we have anything there on YouTube, Shannon? I've got a question from Rita, which maybe Abigail has kind of already answered, but Rita says, what type, which type of plots would they develop for these home theatricals? Did they add characters that were not part of their sphere or did they avoid having characters such as merchants, servants, et cetera? Oh, I think that one, it's gonna depend on the individual because the individual homes could choose to do uh, plays that had already been written, or they could write their own, or they could adapt stuff that had already been written. And characters like merchants and servants uh, were often necessary for the plot lines. So they could definitely be added in, and it would just kind of depend on the individual, uh, one to another, exactly how they would do it. That was individual preference. Anything else? Well, uh, if you want to read some more on this, I have a series of articles that this talk is based on on my website, Random Bits of Fascination. And I would uh, love you guys to come out there and visit with me. Uh, take a look at those. All the references are uh, on the site if you're interested in where any of this information uh, came down to. Um, I'll see if I can find the information on that painting and I will, uh, uh, that's a good question. I'm trying to figure out how best to get it to you. Um, why don't you email me at uh, authormariagrace at uh, gmail.com and you can, uh, I can email you the information on that painting. And it's probably the best way to do it. Uh, and with that, I think it is time to uh, pass this off to Amy and our panel discussion. So I am going to go ahead and make you the host. Does that sound good, Amy? Yes.